Hi, everybody. My name is Nikki Julian. I'm the Outreach Director for the Arizona Wildlife Federation. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm coming to you from my home in Payson, Arizona, the traditional lands of the Western Apache. Arizona Wildlife Federation is dedicated to educating, inspiring, and assisting individuals and organizations to value, conserve, enhance, manage, and protect wildlife and wildlife habitat. Since 1923, we have been uniting Arizonans and decision makers around nonpartisan and science-based solutions to conserve and protect our wildlife, wildlife habitat, and public lands for generations to come. We are also the state affiliate for the National Wildlife Federation. And today I get to tell you about one of my favorite National Wildlife Federation programs that we're doing here in Arizona, which is the Garden for Wildlife program. And we're gonna talk about how to certify your Garden for Wildlife. Gardens do more than provide food or beauty for us humans. They mean the world to wildlife. What do I mean by gardens mean the world to wildlife? Well, gardens provide food for wildlife from the small to the tall, but they also provide so much more. First, let's look at what I mean by wildlife and what I mean by gardens. So gardens are areas with an emphasis on plants that are human designed and or maintained. So that could be a vegetable garden, native plant garden, cactus garden, rain garden, naturalized areas that are maintained that are adjacent to human structures like freeways or businesses, could be agriculture, it could be a few pots on your back porch. By wildlife in the garden, I mean any living uncontrolled animal, not domestic pets and livestock. So we're talking insects, birds, reptiles, mammals, amphibians. Often when we talk about wildlife in the garden, we're talking about, you know, people will bring up the bad boys of the garden, the pocket gophers, the squash bugs, the crows, all these pests, right? Um, there's also the good guys of the garden, uh, the pretty ones, the monarchs, the hummingbirds, the songbirds, but we're going to talk about that whole gamut of different, uh, different wildlife and that point where they are intersecting with us. So the human part of it, rather than the wild. What we're going to be talking about or thinking about this whole time, um, is, is with this garden for wildlife program is this. Uh, personal tolerance with sharing this space with wildlife. So when I go out in the woods, I love seeing deer or elk, but I don't want to see them eating my blueberries. Um, in the backyard, I'm I'm actually okay with scorpions in my backyard in Phoenix, but once they cross into the threshold of the house, they're going to get the shoe. So we all have personal tolerances for sharing our space with wildlife. Um, and the hope is as you're getting to know this, this this process of gardening for wildlife, um, your tolerance is, is, is most likely going to change. Hopefully it'll open up more so you'll be more tolerant, more excited about attracting, attracting wildlife to your garden. So let's talk about certifying your garden. How do you take the regular garden you have, the veggie garden you have, the native plant garden you have, the patio that you have, and make it a certified wildlife habitat? Well, there's the um, address on your screen, NWF, this is National Wildlife Federation Program, um, on the certified page. And there's five categories that you need to have several items of each in these five categories. You'll need food, water, cover, places to raise young, and sustainable practices. And we're going to dive into each one of those. But before we do, I wanted to tell you that certifying your wildlife habitat uh, does cost some money in May and June. It's a little bit cheaper because those are gardening months. So you get a little bit of a discount. Um, and once you certify your garden, you can also then buy some really beautiful signage like this metal sign. You're going to see some examples of these signs in a little bit. And you can ask them to put the Arizona Wildlife Federation logo on your sign. And what happens with that is we get a little bit of kickback for every person who certifies and every person who buys a sign with our logo on it. And that helps me, a staff member, come and give these programs to you. So hopefully you'll support us that way by supporting or certifying your garden. It's also a lot of fun. It also makes you that neighbor in the neighborhood. People see this sign and they want to know more about it and you spread the good word, which is awesome. Okay, so let's dive into some of these practices. The first one is food. Pretty easy idea. There's going to be, when you plant plants, um, they're going to come out with fruits, seeds, or at least vegetative matter. 
matter, excuse me, that is attractive to wildlife. Now, some wildlife you're going you're gonna to want to attract, others you're going to want to repel. And then, of course, you have a tolerance for everything that comes to you as well. So there's naturally occurring food from plants, um, and you'll see a big list of them here. And then you can also add your own human supplement, human provided supplemental food, like a squirrel feeder, a bird feeder, a hummingbird feeder. When you go to apply, they'll want a certain number of each one of these categories. And what I want to make sure that you know is that we recognize that plants have different seasons when they create different parts of their plants. So prickly pear is going to um, create the fruit in the summer, then in the spring it creates edible pads, um, and then in the winter it doesn't do all that much, right? So what we hope is that through the year you're providing several different food opportunities, but you may not be. Maybe you're just starting out in your garden and all you've got is food during the summer or food during the winter. Well, that's fine. We recognize that that uh, seasonality is, is part of the process. Hopefully, as uh, after you do your after you certify your garden, you'll add more and more food groups uh, and food plants so that year round you're able to provide some food for animals. But as long as you have three food items, um, three different food items for wildlife, you're good to go. The other thing I want to mention about about this whole process is that you want to have a great variety of plants. In fact, the more different types of plants you have, the greater diversity of plants that you have, the more wildlife you're going to attract because wildlife uh, has their different needs and niches. Um, some of them will want a very wild looking area. Some of them are just fine with, um, with very human created spaces. Also, once you start getting some wildlife in, you're going to get wildlife that preys on that wildlife. And what you're going to start is creating a food web, which makes for an even more diverse wildlife habitat. All right, let's talk about water now. This is always a really tough one for us here uh, in the desert, is that we don't normally have these naturally occurring water areas but we can create some. So first of all, I want you to think about your irrigation that you have. If you're in Tucson or Phoenix, you're most likely, your home is has some irrigation already uh, built into the structure. Uh, you might have drip irrigation. You can leave a little spaghetti line out that that uh, that drips while the rest of the, the rest of the plants are on or the rest of the system is on. You might have some lawn and have the sprinkler going a couple, maybe a couple times a day. You might have a solar fountain sitting on a picnic table. You might have flood irrigation and that comes on a regular basis. So all those count for different water options. Um, we also recognize, just like with food, is that the water is not going to be um, 365 days a year. There's going to be times when your water is turned off. There's going to be times when it's not raining and filling your rain garden. There's also going to be times when you need to just clean out that uh, bird water or solar fountain and it might take you a couple of days to get back. We also recognize that, you know, your irrigation is not going to be on every day. Your sprinkler might not be on every day. Your flood irrigation may not be on every day. As long as you're providing a few places for water on a fairly regular basis, you're just fine. That works. It doesn't have to be continual. Um, because if we look at things like rain gardens and rain harvesting, it's not raining all the time. Um, we probably only have standing water, maybe 15 minutes, maybe even a day. After that, you get mosquitoes. You don't want standing water anyway. But during the time you are harvesting some of that water, um, it's going to provide uh, some water for wildlife, which is awesome. All right. You also want to provide cover. Now, I love this picture. This is Penny and Poppy from the Desert Botanical Garden Preschool heading into their burrows to escape some of the heat. It's about you know, 11 o'clock in May. So they're trying to they're going to get back home and take some cover. Also a great place for them to hibernate during the winter. With cover, it can be naturally occurring or it can be human created. Now, uh, for Penny and Poppy, it was definitely human human made for their burrows. Um, but uh, a lot of us will have uh, enough space in our yard that there's some cover that's naturally occurring. Uh, maybe it's a dense bush. Um, maybe it's your uh, block wall, a great place for lizards, right? Maybe it's some um, uh, ground cover or a bramble area. And you might even create some spaces um, by uh, creating a leaf pile or a brush pile 
uh, having a um, uh, an overgrown lawn, maybe a bunch grass lawn, a native native grasses lawn. If you have um, some undulating ground, you might get uh, an animal burrowing into it. In fact, if you can have some bare ground, that's a really great idea because here in Arizona, we have over 200 species of bees. and Many of them are single, solitary, ground-dwelling bees, and they need a little bare dirt to be able to create their cover. Places to raise young. Now, a lot of those places, uh, if you have cover, those are fantastic places to raise young. So what you're going to find is some of these plants are a good twofer. In fact, sometimes they're a good threefer. They'll provide food, cover, and places to raise young. So mature trees are fantastic places for birds to raise young. Um, meadow or a native uh, bunch grass garden is a great place for small rodents. Um, wetlands not only provide water, but will also provide uh, good places for amphibians to raise their young. And those are just some ideas. Okay, sustainable practices. Now there's lots and lots of ideas on here, but what I'm going to draw your attention to are a couple different things. One is what's going on in this picture here. This is an herb. It's either dill or fennel. I can't remember which. And all those little bugs on there are ladybugs. In my herb gardens, I let my herbs go, um, go to seed. I let them bolt. Um, I enjoy them while they're in leaf form and then I let them bolt so that I can attract beneficial pollinators to my entire garden. Once they come to one flower, they're probably going to go to other flowers as well. And it's going to bring, bring beneficial insects. And the reason why these ladybugs are so happy is because I've reduced the amount of chemical pesticides and fertilizers that I'm using. And I've, up, I've upped the amount of compost that I'm using, which makes this plant very, very healthy. Reducing the amount of ke chemical pesticides and fertilizers and being tolerant to plants and welcoming beneficial or tolerant to insects and welcoming beneficial insects is called integrated pest management. When you can tolerate a species a little bit longer, when you can use non-toxic methods or methods that target specifically that that insect, such as rubbing your fingers over the uh, aphids to kill them um, instead of spraying, it's healthier, healthier for wildlife and it's healthy for, every, healthy for everybody. The other one I wanna note is the next one down from that, remove non-native species and animals. Well, I've got a dog, he loves to play in the garden, so I'm not gonna remove my non-native dog. I'm also, I have different places in my garden where I grow different things. In the front yard, I love to grow natives because animals can come to that spot without having to worry about getting through my gate. In the backyard is where I like having my veggie gardens, my fruit trees, and my non-native plants, those flowers that I just can't do without, that I just love. Native plants are the best for planting because they're already attuned to that environment. They're gonna use less water. They already have wildlife that has a symbiotic relationship with them. Non-native plants are kind of the next step up. They're not invasive, but they're not native either. So they're probably gonna take a little bit more, uh, take a little bit more water, um, but they're not invasive plants. Now, invasive plants take over. They push out native and non-native species and, um, and cre usually create monocultures also. Our Bermuda grass is a invasive plant, and so is uh, tamarisk um, and buffalo grass. There's quite a few of them here in Arizona. Um, and what we, of course, love to do is reduce our um, the uh, reliance on invasive plants. In fact, if we can stop them at the nursery, that's even better. Another awesome thing to do is to reduce your amount of lawn area. Now, I want to also give a caveat to this as well. This is your tolerance too. If you have kids that love playing soccer on the lawn, if you have a dog that loves laying out on the lawn, if you uh, enjoy putting and so uh, you have a golf area on your lawn, you're using your lawn. Keep it. Enjoy it. At some point, if you're not using it anymore, your kids have grown up, uh, you're done with golf, you don't have a dog anymore, uh, then, you know, that might be time to get rid of your lawn or reduce your lawn. So again, what's really, really important with your sustainable practices is to make yourself a happy gardener. If you're a happy gardener, you're going to go out and garden more, which means that you're going to provide, most likely, more and more places for wildlife to enjoy your garden. If you if you find gardening too difficult, you're probably not going to get out there. You're probably going to let your garden just go to seed and die. And you're, then wildlife can't be there. So if you can work with your tolerances and, and just own up to them and it's okay, and you know that things are going to change over time, your tolerances are going to, tolerance, your needs, your wants are going to change over time, 
you can keep yourself a happy gardener, then you will have wildlife in your yard and it benefits them. All right, so there's lots of different ways to connect to our program. Um, I've been talking about certifying your yard or your patio or your, your mini garden. And my coworker, Trika O'Shane Hawkins in Tucson certified her yard. Look at that beautiful sign that she's got. If you're at a school and you have a schoolyard habitat going like Maryland Elementary in Phoenix, you can uh, certify your schoolyard habitat. If you're in the Eco Schools program, your um, schoolyard habitat doesn't even cost any money. They take care of that for you. It's a pretty awesome perk. Uh, if you're a nonprofit or a business like Willow Bend Environmental Education Center up in Flagstaff, you can also certify it's the same application you use for your home. And look at that gorgeous sign that Willow Bend has on their, uh, on their site. If you're a community like Ajo, Arizona, you can certify your entire community. There's a little bit more that you have to do. You have to have a place, a public place for people to go, a demonstration garden, and then you have to do some educational outreach so that you're getting more of the community to, um, to create habitats than you would otherwise. And if you're a place of worship, you can also sign up, and that's through the Sacred Grounds program. And I'm really, really lucky today to have with me Karen. She's gonna, she's from the King of Glory Lutheran Church in Tempe, and she's gonna talk to you about their certified wildlife habitat that they put in. They redid their entire um, uh, outside uh, grounds, and it's just amazing. So, Karen, I'm gonna turn it right over to you. Thank you for being with us. Hello, environmental educators. I'm Karen Shedler, and I'm really excited to be tagging along with Nikki in this presentation on certified wildlife habitats. You're looking at the sign proudly displayed in my church campus. That church happens to be King of Glory Lutheran Church in Tempe, Arizona. This all began as we were approaching our 50th anniversary a year ago and taking a look at our landscape, which at the time was pretty trite. The church was built about 1970, late 1960s, and the landscaping reflected what was in vogue then. So imagine with me a 2.4 acre church campus, by the way, that includes an auxiliary parking lot across the street, which also needed serious re-landscaping. At the time, everything was landscaped with the trees you see here, Bermuda grass, and more plants of the 1970s. Not exactly native, not exactly conducive to wildlife, all in sorry shape because of decay, deformities caused by wind, some termite damage, etc. So now it is landscaped with over 150 trees, nearly 700 shrubs, over 300 ground covers, and we have a preschool garden where we, cre we are creating a pollinator habitat in addition to our vegetable garden. We did have the services of a master landscape architect simply because a 50 year old landscaping project required something newer than 50 year old irrigation systems, which were in sorry shape. They'd been patched, repaired, etc. So this was a literally a start over process from beginning to end. Demolition began last October. New plants were put in late January, early February of this year. And the photos you're about to see were all taken in early August of this year. Once this area was nothing but olive trees and Bermuda grass, now you see a great deal more biodiversity, all xeric plants, mostly native, not all, but all xeric plants. We do have desert willow. This happens to be the bubba variety with the dark purple flowers. Interestingly enough, our assistant pastor was in a business just down the street a couple blocks from our church recently and was asked, when did you put up that new building? Well, that new building you're looking at here has been there for nearly 40 years, but it was obliterated by African sumac trees and olive trees. Once those came down and these new trees and new landscaping went up, it gives the, the appearance of a brand new building entirely. Southern Avenue was once lined with olive trees. As Tempe was developing in the late 60s, early 70s, they had a theme, pine trees along Broadway Avenue and olive trees along Southern. Well, there are still lots of other olive trees along Southern, but none on our church property anymore. A little side note, we also replaced light fixtures. These now all reflect downwards, so we are not contributing to any light pollution. The front of our church, our entrance, Texas Sunny Mesquite, Sierra Bouquet, uh, Sage, New Gold Lantana, all attractive to various wildlife. Just a side note, those palm trees you see in the back, 
not ours. Those are on city of Tempe property in medians. We don't have any more palm trees. They are attractive to non-native wildlife. So we got rid of those. And of course the termites help take down a couple as well. We did get our preschoolers involved with this too. Everybody has a role in caring for the creation and being good stewards of the earth. Here you see some of the kiddos last, late last um, year, end of spring, before school actually was over. They were planting milkweed. We are creating a milkweed butterfly habitat here, hoping to attract monarchs. We have a few more plants to go in the ground. Preschool is now back in session, so we'll soon be working with the kiddos, getting those in place. We also have a woolly butterfly bush there. We'll be augmenting this. There is a vegetable garden here too, but we're making one side of this entirely for pollinators. And this year, our incredible summer rains have brought flowers, and those flowers have brought pollinators. We're seeing several species of butterflies now. We're anticipating that most of our trees are going to be big enough by the time fall migrations of birds come along. And of course, we have some lizards there as well. So we are stewards of nature. We've applied to become part of the Sacred Grounds Program with National Wildlife Federation. We want to become a demonstration, not only for the community of faith worshipers and our own members, but also for the general community and other houses of worship. We are an untapped resource for this. So let's go make those grounds truly sacred grounds. Thanks for listening and let's get planting. All right, wasn't that a wonderful story from Karen? I loved hearing about what King of Glory is doing. The Sacred Grounds program, same kind of thing with your uh, community habitat program. Uh, it, you need to provide a demonstration garden and then um, inspire the people who come to that that meeting house, that place of worship to um, to create their own gardens, give them some education and help them understand how they're stewards of the earth. So if you liked what you what you saw, um, if you want to know more about the Garden for Wildlife program, uh, keep in mind this is self um, self declaring. I'm not going to come out and look at your garden and go, oh, I don't know if you did all this. I'm not going to come out in two years and making sure you're still doing it. It's you telling us that you're ready to have a certified wildlife habitat. And as you go through the application, you're probably going to get even more ideas for things to do for your garden. Well, I hope you enjoyed our chat about the Garden for Wildlife program. We went over the five components of a certified wildlife habitat and the places where you can certify, whether it's your home, your business, nonprofit venue, uh, school, place of worship, or your entire community. Here's what I'm asking you to do. I want you to garden as if your life depended on it, because it does. Gardening for Wildlife helps us to replace habitat loss through development, and it also mitigates climate change. But it's not just your life you're saving, it's wildlife lives that you're saving as well. Even if you just have a small space, even a, a patio or a planter or a small veggie garden, you can make a difference to wildlife. So go out there and be happy gardener. Thank you for joining me.